Item Number SCP-027 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The host of SCP-027, currently Subject 027-02, is to be kept in a 5m by 5m containment cell with a graded raised floor connected to a strong vacuum system. All creatures removed from the subject's containment cell are to be incinerated, except for a small portion to be diverted for analysis and necropsy. The cell is to be cleaned and inspected for structural damage daily. Subject 027-02 must be monitored by at least two personnel at all times. Any unusual behavior or vital signs on the part of the subject or the appearance of any unusual species in the subject's vicinity must immediately be reported to Level 4 personnel. Security personnel assigned to SCP-027 must be inoculated against all known animal-borne pathogens, and must be armed with tranquilizer guns, with standing orders to subdue the subject if the need arises. Until SCP-027 is better understood, no personnel level 4 clearance or higher should approach within 200 meters of the subject. SCP-027 appears to be a phenomenon of unknown source that seems to be tied to one human subject currently 027-02, at a time. As host to SCP-027, Subject 027-02 is constantly surrounded by swarming vermin that are drawn to his location. The subject does not appear able to assert control over these creatures in any way, and is in fact prone to occasional attacks from feral specimens. These creatures have also been known to attack personnel who approach too closely. Wherever the subject goes, an initial swarm of flying insects, such as gnats and flies, will start to form a circle around him, usually within two to three minutes. Shortly thereafter, crawling animals, including lice, cockroaches, worms, spiders, mice, and rats, will begin to appear. The longer the subject remains in a location, the more vermin will gather there. When the subject leaves a location, some of these creatures will follow but most will disperse. SCP-027 has been known to transfer between hosts once, upon the death of the first known host, SCP-027-01. See Appendix 1 for more information. Since SCP-027 could likely repeat this feat upon the death of Subject-027-02, all high-value personnel should be kept far away from the current host until more about SCP-027 is understood. SCP-027 has also likely transferred between hosts an unknown number of times before containment. Research into potential previous hosts has commenced, with preliminary evidence suggesting that SCP-027 may have existed for at least years. Appendix 1 Timeline of Significant Events April 1990 Subject 027-01 is discovered in an abandoned warehouse outside that had been completely overrun by rats, cockroaches, and other vermin, and is contained and cataloged as SCP-027. The subject is described as a Caucasian male in his late thirties, of average height but gaunt, filthy, and covered in bites and scratches. The subject also shows symptoms of degraded mental health evidence of heavy use of alcohol and illicit drugs, and signs of prolonged sleep deprivation. October 2000 Subject expires. Autopsy shows more than 70% of the subject's body a colony of rats nesting in the subject's abdomen for at least generations. October 2000 and between 140 and 150 hours after the subject's death, security officer reports being awoken by breathing problems due to a large housefly having crawled up his nose, later shown to have lain eggs. Subsequent observations led to categorization of officer as Subject 027-02. The original host is reclassified as Subject 027-01 and SCP-027 is redefined. 
Appendix 2 Transcript of Interview 027-201 The following interview was conducted on October 2000 shortly after Subject 027-02 was identified and transferred to the containment cell that had housed Subject 027-01. Good morning, officer. How are you feeling? Scared. Confused. Mostly scared, though. Understandable. And itchy. I feel like I need to shower all the damn time. Ah, but what about, um, inside? Do you feel anything different inside you, like a presence? No, I don't think I do. I haven't really noticed anything like that. You haven't felt anything different since the original host died, besides the itching? No, I can't say I have. What about any sort of voices? Or compulsions? No, I haven't felt anything except bugs crawling over me. I feel dirty and scared and… duck. What about my family? You gotta get this thing out of me so I can see them again. Of… of course. We're going to do everything we can to get 027 out of you. God, I… I'm sorry. Note, shortly after this interview took place, Dr. Javison and several other members of the research team for SCP-027 were transferred to the SCP-1772 project. Level 4-4511 Classified Item Number SCP-4511 Pending Special Containment Procedures The factory SCP-4511 resides in has been purchased by the Foundation and designated Provisional Site-4511. MTF-PI-1 City Slickers have been assigned to manage containment and security of the object. All organic matter which has exited SCP-4511 is to be returned inside, regardless of living or deceased. File Serve Notice As of writing, research into SCP-4511 is still ongoing. Some errors may be present. Description: SCP-4511 is a large mechanical construct located in the basement of Danforth Meatpacking a disused meatpacking factory in Chicago, USA. SCP-4511 externally resembles a domestic pig, measuring approximately 15 meters by 25 meters by 20 meters at its widest points, and is constructed of iron, which has become heavily oxidized following several years of improper maintenance. SCP-4511's primary entrance point is a large blast furnace in a constant state of activation despite being disconnected from all fuel lines and ignition sources. SCP-4511's left flank contains a thin 5 cm long slit that, upon certain conditions being met, will print an index card carrying a series of instructions. The factory was initially raided by Foundation agents, embedded within the Chicago Police Department, in response to reports of occult activity in the area. They encountered heavy resistance from a group of occult worshippers who had taken residence in the basement. MTF Epsilon-9 fire eaters, were dispatched to lend support to the Chicago Police Department. Of the 47 cultists that had previously inhabited the factory, only one survived their injuries for more than 72 hours. While the individual was treated for their injuries, Foundation personnel began studying SCP-4511. The following card was discovered left within SCP-4511. Current demand. A flock of my own. Satisfied. Every twelve hours, SCP-4511 produced another copy of the card. On 1-24-65, the last surviving victim of the raid on the factory was pronounced deceased. At the same time, SCP-4511 produced a new punch card. Current demand. The metal teeth that endlessly turn. Period. One week. The SCP-4511 research team requested to conduct experiments on the object, which was initially denied by lead researcher Westgren, but later overruled by Regional Director Caleb. T. 
Test Logs Test 1 Demand The Metal of the Suffocating Prison Resources 57 pieces of scrap iron, scavenged from within Provisional Site 4511. Procedure Gears thrown into SCP-4511 individually. Results Sound of metal crunching persisted for two minutes and three seconds. Three hours after the test, all gears in Provisional Site 4511 underwent a rapid oxidation process, rusting significantly. SCP-4511 itself remained unaffected. Test 2 Demand Oil to slick in my frozen joints. Resources Three 200 liter drums of machine oil, transported from Site 12. Procedure Drums were thrown into primary orifice. Results Low pitch gurgling heard for 38 minutes before the remains of the oil drums were expelled. SCP 4511 then began to shake violently for 4 minutes. A large amount of rusted scrap iron and two domesticated pig femurs were then expelled. Test 3 Demand Two of my children, made in my image, made in flesh. Resources Two adult domestic pigs, sexed pair. D-98123-SSD and D-98124-SSD Procedure both subjects forced into SCP-4511's primary orifice. Results: Subjects pass through first layer of fire unharmed, obscuring them from view. Five seconds later, high-pitched squeals were heard, ceasing after 25 seconds. For 47 minutes afterwards, a low-pitched gurgling was heard emanating from SCP-4511. Test 4 Demand the hooks used to hang my children's corpses. Resources: 17 meat hooks, found within Provisional Site 4511. Procedure: Hooks were thrown into primary orifice. Result: Metal crunching was heard within 20 seconds and persisted for 11 minutes before a spherical metal object was expelled at high speeds, terminating Agent McHenry. McHenry's body was then thrown into the primary orifice. Test 5 Demand. A canine. First I consume his best friend, then him. Resources. One German Shepherd. D-197231-CLF Procedure. Subject tranquilized and forced in the primary orifice after managing to exit twice. Results. Yelping heard for approximately 27 minutes before the subject was expelled through the primary orifice. 55 minutes later. Seven projectiles exited SCP-4511 at a high velocity. Further examination identified the projectiles to be teeth, specifically six molars, dog, and one canine, human. Test 6 Demand A worker for the line Resources D-023492 Deceased due to natural causes Procedure Subject was then thrown into the primary orifice. Results. Within four seconds, SCP-4511 emitted loud crunching noises before abruptly ejecting D-023492. Subject was extremely disfigured due to heat damage and repeated blunt force trauma. Upon dissection, subject was found to be lacking several internal organs. Test 7 Demand A worker for the line Resources D-023547 Procedure Due to non-compliance, subject was forced into SCP-4511 using an electric shock prod. Results Screaming heard for approximately two hours. Thirty-four minutes after the test, a liquid mixture of human blood, pig urine, machine oil, and rust began leaking from various points across SCP-4511. This persisted for 46 minutes, before abruptly ceasing. The human portion of the liquid was a genetic match for lead researcher Western. Test 8 Demand A youth to grow in the factories. Resources Procedure Due to non-compliance, subject was forced into SCP-4511 using an electric shock prod. Results Test 9 Demand Fuel for my internally burning fire. 
resources. 450 kg of refined coal, found within Provisional Site 4511. Procedure: Coal was manually shoveled in the primary orifice by researchers Matthias and Gilroy. Results. Blame within primary orifice grew by approximately 60%, terminating researcher Matthias and injuring researcher Gilroy. Provisional Site 4511 then began to shake violently for 3 hours and 22 minutes. 55 minutes after the shaking began, groaning was heard below SCP-4511. Test 10 Demand The False Foreman Deliver to my ma to prove your faith. Resources Lead Researcher Western Procedure Subject incapacitated using a 9mm bullet to the left thigh and moved to SCP-4511's entrance. Subject awoke midway through test and began attempting to bargain with researchers. Results. Lead Researcher Western consumed by SCP-4511, screaming heard for approximately 4 minutes and 17 seconds before ceasing. See Incident 4511.1 for further details. Incident 4511.1 Eight hours following the reception of Test Report 10, Regional Director Caleb authorized MTF Epsilon 11, Nine-Tailed Fox, to raid Provisional Site 4511 after reports of possibly compromised site security. A transcript is attached. MTF Body Camera Video Log Transcript Date May 13, 65. Task Force MTF Epsilon 11, Nine Tailed Fox. Subject Provisional Site 4511. Team Lead Epsilon 1. Team Members Epsilon 2, Epsilon 3, Epsilon 4. Begin Log. Safety's off. Sound off on my count. 1, 2, 3, Four. Team enters the factory single file. Guns raised. No sign of research team on the main production floor. Descending into basement. Proceed with caution. Team crosses the factory floor to the freight elevator and enter. Three. Time to earn your keep. Yes, sir. Epsilon Three moves to the electrical box of the elevator and attempts to pull it open. After a few seconds of pulling, he succeeds in opening the cover. The interior of the fuse box is revealed to have been sealed to the door with a layer of waxy material. Is that… fat? Ugh. Probably from years of disuse. I don't think anyone was cleaning it even when this place was still open. 3. Can you get it working, or do we have to throw ourselves down, lemming style? Yeah. I should be able to rig something up real quick. Give me a second. Epsilon-3 spends several minutes interacting with the fuse box. With the lurch, the elevator begins slowly dropping. Well done. Unless they somehow move the thing, SCP-4511 should be somewhere on this floor. Weapons free, though we prefer it if at least a couple were brought in alive. Roger that. The elevator reaches a stop and the overhead lights shut off. Three? Was that you? I didn't touch the lighting fuses. That's something else. Doesn't matter. Four, get over here and help me open these doors. Epsilon-1 and Epsilon-4 work together to open the cargo doors of the elevator. The entire lighting system for the lower floor is shut off. Flashlights on. They're creeping about here somewhere. Team advances onto the catwalk and continue in silence for two minutes until Epsilon-2 pauses. Jesus fuck 3, did you piss yourself? What? No. We're walking in it. Epsilon-1 gestures to the catwalk floor and the shallow puddle of yellow liquid covering it. Fuck me, I think I'm gonna bomb it. God, that's… who the fuck does that? The team is interrupted by a drop splashing onto the puddle. They raise their weapons and flashlights to reveal a fleshy growth attached to the ceiling, a hole from which is leaking the urine. Keep moving. What are you guys? Make sure you're looking at it. The team continues forward, Epsilon-4 bringing up the rear to keep a view on the growth. They continue in silence for another four minutes, descending a stairwell. 
We're reaching the basement floor. Command is unintelligible. They're cutting off. Repeat. We're reaching the basement floor. Sound off. One. Two. Three. Silence. Where the fuck is Spore? I… she was just next to me. Did we go back to look for her? Yeah, get ready. The team retreats up three flights of stairs. Epsilon-4 is splayed out on a landing, unconscious. Two! On it! Epsilon-2 begins applying first aid to Epsilon-4, who has a large wound in her right thigh. Epsilon-4 slowly regains consciousness. I don't know what happened. One minute I was behind you guys, and the next, I'm clutching my head here. Active hostile entity in the area. Possibly anti-memetic. Can you walk? N -n no Take your gun and shoot anything that isn't us. We'll be back, I swear. The team returns down the stairwell, reaching the bottom and spreading out. The floor is largely covered in various furnaces. There's something up ahead. The entrance to SCP-4511 is visible at the end of the room. A large pile sits next to it. Upon closer view, the pile is comprised of several white-coated bodies, all suffering from extreme exsanguination. A figure sits on the floor next to the pile. Hands up! Now! The figure stands up, wearing the uniform of a researcher. A large burn scar stretches across his right cheek. He is clutching something in his right hand. Whatever's in your hand, drop it! Whatever you think you can do to me, it's nothing. Nothing compared to what it can do. What's it? The individual gestures behind him, seemingly at SCP-4511 and the pile of corpses. I took their oil to feed it, and I'll take yours too. I'm giving you five seconds to sit the fuck down before I blow your brains out. You can't win. If you kill me, it wins. And you'll never let it win, because you've had it so drilled into you that it is wrong. Epsilon-2 terminates the individual with a single shot to the head. A rumbling sound emanates from SCP-4511. Epsilon-3 advances and inspects what the individual is holding. A small clump of bloody flesh and a scrap of paper. Meet from those who seek to do in my faithful. Epsilon-3 picks up the piece of flesh and throws it into SCP-4511. The flames roar. What the fuck? Why did you do that? I don't know. Come on. We've got to get four. She won't last long as she is. The team reascends the main stairwell to the location four was sitting in. Four is unmoving, her gun beside her. Fuck! Check for a pulse. Epsilon-2 shakes his head. Nothing. Christ! One! What do we do? Epsilon-1 sighs. Only thing we can do. Head back up. We terminated the threat, and Director Caleb's is outside with the emergency rescon team. Let's go, then. We need backup to clean this place out. End log. Document 4511.1 Due to unforeseen circumstances, the current containment and research team for SCP-4511 are no longer in a position to do their duties. Until further notice, I will be removing myself from the Regional Director position in order to take the position of Lead Researcher on the SCP-4511 project. This anomaly is more dangerous than we originally gave it credit for, and it led to the deaths of twenty-four people. I refuse to let that happen again. Regards, Lead Researcher Caleb Incident 4511.2 Two hours following Incident 4511.1, SCP-4511 produced a punch card before ceasing all activity. In-depth examination of SCP-4511 revealed no remains of any subjects or alternative fuel sources that could have been used for the flames. Current demand. A flock of my own. Satisfied.
Item number SCP-1155 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-1155 is currently contained in a disused parking lot adjacent to an abandoned shopping center in the city metropolitan area. The building is to be marked condemned, and access to both it and the car park should be restricted by Foundation personnel, posing as security guards from the front company. Civilians are to be deterred from entering the site, and supplied with standard cover story 47. Structural instability, sinkhole, if they inquire as to why. SCP-1155 must be kept under constant observation by motion tracking security cameras. If SCP-1155 is observed to vanish, Mobile Task Force Pi-1 City Slickers, should be notified immediately. Personnel should not routinely attempt to view SCP-1155 directly. Observation must be conducted remotely. Whatever flat surface that SCP-1155 is currently inhabiting should be obscured from view by any standard Class II enclosed mobile containment unit, or, in situations where this cannot be affected in a timely fashion, by obstructing it with a vehicle, storage container, or displaced rubble, provided that this can be done without damaging a 3-meter area around SCP-1155's image. Following Incident 1155-B, it has been observed that completely enclosing SCP-1155 has a tendency to hasten a relocation event. Revised procedures now recommend the evacuation of the immediate area surrounding SCP-1155 to the minimum distance necessary to prevent contact with the general public, unless SCP-1155 manifests in a high visibility location or anywhere where preventing public egress is impossible. At the present time, SCP-1155 cannot be permanently contained by any known means. Approximately every two to four months, SCP-1155 has been observed to spontaneously relocate itself to other urban environments, moving as little as 15 meters from its current position up to a maximum observed distance of 800 km. These relocation events can also be triggered by damage to the surface that SCP-1155 adheres to, interruption of an attack, any attempt to reduce the size of SCP-1155's confinement space to prevent visual contact. Therefore, current containment efforts are centered around swiftly ascertaining SCP-1155's new location and isolating it from public view. When such a relocation event occurs, Mobile Task Force Pi-1 should be immediately deployed alongside local assets to locate the new site as quickly as possible, re-implement containment procedures, and detain any witnesses. Survivors of attack should be detained. Uninjured witnesses may be administered Class A amnestics and then released. Description. SCP-1155 manifests in the work of street art, or graffiti, depicted in the form of a humanoid creature with sinewy forelimbs, claw-like hands, and the head and feathers of an owl. The depicted pose is variable, but tends towards a predatory stance, with eyes that appear to attract the viewer. Anyone viewing this image directly will experience a compulsion to investigate it further. Victims describe a nervous fascination and a desire to move closer. This can be resisted with effort, especially if the subject is aware of SCP-1155's anomalous properties. If a subject approaches to within two meters and is not in the line of sight of another person, they will be subjected to a violent attack, suffering severe lacerations, dismemberment of extremities, whole or partial removal of soft body parts, and penetrating head trauma consistent with those that would be inflicted by a large beak and or talons. The attack generally takes about six seconds to conclude, upon which both SCP-1155 and the victim will vanish, and SCP-1155 will reappear elsewhere in the usual manner of a relocation event within seven days. Attacks can be halted before this event by re-establishing line of sight to the victim, but this is not recommended. See Record of Incident 1155-A. Attempts to track where the victims are taken by equipping test subjects with GPS locators have failed. Based on tested interruptions performed at predefined intervals, the attack follows a defined pattern. 
the victim will first be restrained, and the eyes and tongue will be removed, rapidly followed by the amputation of the hands and feet. The victim will then be disemboweled, and the intestines and stomach removed. Death usually follows due to shock or rapid exsanguination, but only if the attack is interrupted by visual contact. The fate of victims who disappear along with SCP-1155 at the conclusion of the attack is unknown. Addenda Incident 1155-A Two surviving Class D personnel used for attack interruption test were given medical treatment and kept alive in the aftermath of the event. Both were incoherent and could not adequately communicate what had happened to them. Though D-89786, whose eyes were removed during the attack, claimed to still be able to see, and provided a description of a larder containing bodies of previous victims of SCP-1155, along with the entity itself. D-89786 escaped from on-site quarters during a containment breach by SCP and was pursued by local law enforcement and nearby who were told he was a severely disturbed patient from a local mental hospital. Officer reports they saw the suspect walking into an alleyway, but before they could apprehend, a scream was heard, and when they rounded the corner, it was found that D-89786 had disappeared, the alleyway with a dead end, with no visible exits. D-89789, both eyes, tongue, hands, and feet removed before attack halted, was successfully transferred to site. A period of rapid relocations was noted in SCP-1155, where it was observed in several public places with a posture that suggested hunting or tracking behavior. SCP-1155 appeared for several hours high up on the side of the building in full view of many witnesses, who fortunately could not access it. In view of the difficulty of containment, Site Command made the decision to bring D-89789 back into the city. SCP-1155 was observed to appear several times on walls, advertisement boards, and bridges along the transport vehicle's path. D-89789 was observed to become increasingly agitated and hysterical during this process. D-89789 was transferred to a remote location on the edge of city limits, placed in front of SCP-1155, whereupon visual contact was broken. SCP-1155 and D-89789 disappeared, and SCP-1155 resumed previous pattern of manageable relocation behavior. Incident 1155-B Elements of Mobile Task Force Pi-1 located SCP-1155 in an abandoned subway station after most recent relocation event. Team Leader made the decision to obscure SCP-1155 with a vending machine until more containment resources arrived, on the basis that there were not enough Task Force members on site to guarantee a secure perimeter, and local transients were known to use the area for shelter. SCP-1155 immediately displaced to a nearby children's playground, causing casualties before it could again be located. Due to the highly public nature of this location, decision was made at command level to again provoke a displacement event, resulting in the current containment location. Containment at the current location was expensive, requiring that an entire shopping center be acquired by the Foundation and then subsequently closed but the revised containment procedures have resulted in the longest time since a relocation event to date. The last few containment locations may point to a disturbing trend. Previously, SCP-1155 seemed to have a pattern of appearing in low-traffic urban areas, often abandoned buildings or quiet underpasses. At risk of anthropomorphism, it appears to have become emboldened and will now readily appear in public spaces which makes containment difficult. Over the objections of the containment team, leave the damn thing uncovered. Better we lose a few urban explorers or nosy kids every couple of years, rather than risk it having abduct more people before we can locate it each time. Dr. B
Item number SCP-589 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-589 must be contained within a sealed, reinforced container that is welded shut. Under no circumstances is SCP-589 to be removed from its container, physically contacted, or even seen. SCP-589 and its container must sit on a scale so that it may be continually weighed to confirm SCP-589's presence. SCP-589's containment cell may only be accessed by Level 4 personnel, and must be guarded by at least two Level 4 security personnel with 24-hour surveillance. Under no circumstances is SCP-589 allowed to leave its containment cell. Any personnel attempting unauthorized entry or removal of SCP-589 will be terminated. Should containment be breached, then the entire sector SCP-589 is held in must be immediately purged via demolition charges or incendiary devices. Any personnel assigned to the sector that managed to escape must be questioned and then immediately detained for psychological screening. In the event that SCP-589 must be handled without the protection of the container, the only personnel authorized to handle SCP-589 must be cleared by Foundation psychologists and must have a psionic resistance index of 30 or higher. Once their task is complete, all personnel that have handled SCP-589 must submit to a mandatory psychological screening. Description. SCP-589 is a stuffed animal that is able to change its appearance based on the subjective desires of the first person to come into contact with it. SCP-589 has the ability to create a calming, soothing sensation within anybody who sees or comes into physical contact with it. This ability appears to be mimetic, as it is able to spread via copies of itself as well as pictures depicting its likeness. However, the effectiveness of these copies is directly proportional to the quality of the product. The calming effect SCP-589 imparts is not unlike the use of narcotics, as it stimulates the areas of the brain that are responsible for feelings of relief and euphoria, and encourages the production of chemicals and hormones that reduce stress. However, this effect quickly becomes addictive with infected individuals becoming completely dependent on SCP-589 after extended exposure. Once addicted, an individual's interaction with SCP-589 or any of its copies borders on complete obsession, and they are compelled to create more copies of SCP-589 and attempt to spread them. However, what makes SCP-589 dangerous are its after-effects. After a certain period of time, SCP-589 will immediately vanish. SCP-589, any of its physical copies, and all versions of it in printed and electronic media will completely disappear. This sudden and massive disappearance of SCP-589 results in catastrophic consequences for those infected by SCP-589. Without SCP-589 to keep them passive and calm, Infected individuals will immediately suffer a variety of severe withdrawal symptoms, including, but not limited to, manic depression, psychosis, heightened aggression, uncontrollable despair, dementia, mania, paranoia, and various other behavioral disorders. It is not known how or why SCP-589 does this though there is speculation that SCP-589 feeds off the mental anguish it causes to those completely obsessed with it. Once the process is complete, SCP-589 will reappear at another random location and repeat the cycle. SCP-589 was tracked down and contained after the Foundation received a string of mysterious reports of villages and towns in rural areas being found with their entire population dead apparently having slaughtered each other in a massive and violent riot. The Foundation began tracking these incidents, but could not determine their cause until Dr. Bl discovered a pattern in the targeted areas. Using the data Dr. Bl provided, the Foundation managed to intercept and contain SCP-589. 
though several personnel had to undergo rigorous psychological treatment to counter the effects of SCP-589. Currently, SCP-589 has not attempted to leave its containment area, which has led researchers to hypothesize that SCP-589 follows a very specific life cycle pattern. Infection Pattern After various experiments on test groups consisting of D-Class personnel, SCP-589 appears to be solely targeted at individuals with severe insecurities or those suffering from high amounts of stress. Infection rates on subjects whose psychological profile suggested that they were susceptible to high amounts of stress or low self-esteem showed a 90% infection rate while subjects with little to no stress and high self-esteem only suffer from a 12% infection rate. This confirms Dr. Blank's initial hypothesis that SCP-589 targets areas with high numbers of people that are easy for it to infect. Sentience Hypothesis It is a real possibility that SCP-589 may in fact be a sentient creature, rather than an inanimate object. Study of SCP-589's movement patterns, correlated with data about its infection patterns, suggests that SCP-589 deliberately controls where it appears at the beginning of every cycle. However, we need more data and experiments in order to confirm this. Administrative Note Due to catastrophic loss of containment during Experiment 589-05, resulting in Incident 589-40. SCP-589 is to be permanently kept in a secure container. Any request to remove SCP-589 requires O5 level clearance. O5- Item number SCP-274 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Any buildings found to be infected with SCP-274 are to be reported immediately to a superior and the leader of Mobile Task Force Pi-1, City Slickers. MTF Pi-1 is to incinerate cases of SCP-274-1 and secure the infected buildings by performing a quarantine with a 1 km radius under the guise of the local police and fire department. MTF Pi-1 is to terminate any cases of SCP-274-2 through the use of high-pressure fire hoses. Civilians insisting on entering an instance of SCP-274-1 are to be detained and have one Class B amnestic administered. Any apparatus used to contain or handle SCP-274 should either be incinerated or entirely composed of metal or glass and washed thoroughly immediately after use. The cover story for a containment breach of SCP-274 should be gang-related arson. SCP-274 is a paint of variable color. Buildings inflicted with SCP-274 appear to have large amounts of graffiti covering the sides of the building, and often have large, disturbing designs to them. See Addendum 274. While its consistency is that of normal paint, its composition reveals it to be 28% hemoglobin. 12% gastric acid, and 60% common components consistent with Krylon brand spray paint. When SCP-274 is applied to a wall, it will begin to spread until it has covered the wall and any other walls attached to it. When SCP-274 is applied to a wall, it will begin to spread until it has covered the wall and any walls attached to it. SCP-274 is unable to spread on metal, glass, and horizontal surfaces. While SCP-274 spreads on buildings, it will convert the interior of a wall into a large mesoglea, the interior walls into a gastrodermis, and the exterior walls act as a protective shell and epidermis. Buildings coated entirely with SCP-274 will become cases of SCP-274-1. SCP-274-1 exhibits signs of life react to stimuli, and behave in a manner similar to many species of the Anthozoic class. Buildings converted into SCP-274-1 lure passing civilians by emitting noises from inside SCP-274-1. 
sounds of glass breaking, loud coughing, or pained whimpers have all been reported from D-Class personnel. It is currently unknown whether SCP-274-1 or the SCP-274-2s are responsible for this behavior, as the noises stop immediately upon entry. Typically, civilians would either call the police or investigate the noises themselves. As subjects search inside SCP-274-1, they will be recognized as food by instances of SCP-274-2, if any are present. When a victim enters a room inside SCP-274-1, barring the entryway, they will immediately be suctioned into a gastrovascular cavity belonging to SCP-274-1, later processing them into SCP-274 and one instance of SCP-274-2. Specimens of SCP-274-2 are organisms composed of SCP-274 that appear as men or women wearing a gas mask or respirator, along with a bright pastel-colored hoodie. SCP-274-2 is able to support its heavy weight by its thickness and density in its membrane, which consists of 45-50% of the mass of SCP-274-2. SCP-274-2 act as nematocysts for SCP-274-1, and can disguise themselves by merging into the walls. This is done by heavily compacting themselves and implanting itself into an interior wall, save for their mask, which flattens around the wall and disguises itself as standard graffiti. This behavior is proven to be a means of ambushing food for SCP-274-1 and will only react when it detects something it considers a food source. SCP-274-2 possess a hinged operculum that ejects SCP-274 located in the right hand. This operculum looks identical to a normal spray can and can project SCP-274 in a similar manner. SCP-274-2 will attempt to spray SCP-274 into the eyes and mouth of its victims in an attempt to incapacitate and encapsulate them. This method of attack is shown to be very painful and will blind and numb the victim from the neck down. Once tagged, the victim is placed into a gastrovascular cavity, resulting in a new SCP-274-2. SCP-274-2 are able to duplicate themselves while inside an instance of SCP-274-1 and will produce one new SCP-274-2 every 24 hours. Once 12 SCP-274-2 specimens reside inside one SCP-274-1, further cases of SCP-274-2 will leave SCP-274-1 and find a new building to spray with SCP-274, while avoiding any people they may encounter. Once a building at least two kilometers away from another SCP-274-1 is found, the SCP-274-2 will spray SCP-274 onto the building until it has completely dehydrated itself of SCP-274 and dies, resulting in another instance of SCP-274-1. If left unchecked, it is estimated that SCP-274 could cover a large city within 20 days. Addendum 274 Date Found Appearance January 2001 SCP-274-1-1 is painted to resemble a large bus with the number on its side. The front of the bus has been replaced by a human-like face, and the back is on fire. Bus patrons all look towards the front of the bus and do not seem to react to the fire. April 2006 SCP-274-1-2 is painted to look as if it's crumbling apart. At the base, people are illustrated to be running away from SCP-274-1-2, and a face can be seen forming from the falling rubble. March 2010 SCP-274-1-3 depicts a beach with three sharks in the water, and several people running from the shore. This scene is illustrated behind a large cartoon tiki statue, which takes up most of the front of SCP-274-1-3. August 2011 SCP-274-1-4 
illustrates what is presumed to be Noah's Ark at sea. The creatures boarding the Ark do not match any known species. The Ark is depicted to have a face with several sharp teeth, and eyes devoid of pupils or irises. November 2011 SCP-274-1-5 depicts several figures in Level 3 biohazard suits at the base. Figures are seen fighting each other for what appears to be a bottle of hand sanitizer. Several cadavers are piled on top of one another in the background, with a large green cloud in the shape of a canine-like face emitting from them. This face is shown laughing, presumably at the people fighting. July 2012 SCP-274-1-6 is painted to resemble a mausoleum, with a large human skull painted on its front. Illustrated at the base of SCP-274-1-6 are figures suffering from advanced stages of rigor mortis. Most notable is that several figures appear to be wearing the standard issue tactical armor distributed by MTF Pi-1. August 2012 SCP-274-1-7 is decorated with the scene of MTF Pi-1 setting SCP-274-1-7 on fire through the use of Molotov cocktails. A large depiction of SCP-274-2 can be seen attacking MTF Pi-1. August 2012 Operatives dead as a result of a large mob of SCP-274-2, numbering between 2 Level 1 slash 5907 classified. Item number SCP-5907. Safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-5907 is held within modified safe storage locker 58 at Site 51. The unit is fitted with a smoke detector, and if at any time the alarm activates, the locker is to be flooded with water. A total of 21 individual articles of clothing are folded and stored within the locker. Further testing of SCP-5907 has been deemed unnecessary. SCP-5907 is a 19th century oil lamp comprised of a small oil chamber and a wick consisting of hemp and cotton. Igniting the wick causes SCP-5907 to emit trace amounts of fluctuating Akiva radiation. After approximately 30 seconds, SCP-5907 starts releasing smoke, with inhalation causing transfiguration of human tissue into synthetic cotton-like material and calcium-heavy biomatter such as bones into aluminum. There is no known method of terminating the transmutation. Discovery On February 23, 2020, the Foundation received a police file containing information on severely mutated human corpses, including several photographs. Foundation agents were deployed to the residence where the corpses were located, which was still under police investigation. SCP-5907 was discovered due to its abnormal levels of Akiva radiation, detected by investigators GADS, General Analysis Devices. It was located in the room of William Corbin the son of the residence's owner. The bodies of William, Veronica, and Fresco Corbin were all located in the room. A video file was also recovered from William's personal computer. Began Log Okay, it's February 19th, and I picked up this really cool lamp from a pawn shop down on Wilson Avenue. William holds up SCP-5907. Now, the guy there said this thing is a real deal genie lamp. William turns SCP-5907 to reveal its underside. See here? It says, Levi Strauss 1840. According to the guy at the shop, Levi Strauss himself used this to become successful. I believe in the supernatural, but this seemed almost too good to be true, so I couldn't pass it up. William sets SCP-5907 down on a small table in front of the camera. 
So, all I've got to do is light the lamp. He uncovers the wick and lights it. Rub it three times and, I don't know, I guess just wait for the genie? <laughs> the lamp begins producing smoke from its spout. Holy shit, I can't believe- William begins coughing as a tendril of smoke forces his way down his throat. <coughs> Help! The smoke detector in William's room begins beeping as William collapses to the ground, clutching his chest. The skin on William's fingers, nose, and neck begins to peel, revealing a blue fabric underneath. William coughs out blood mixed with a fibrous white substance. The door to the room opens. Oh my god, Fresco, get in here! William moves to the side and opens his mouth to speak. Clumps of bloody cotton fibers fall from his open mouth. Two tendrils of smoke are seen drifting off screen. Help! <coughs> what the fuck is go- <coughs> Two thuds can be heard as the coffin turns to gas for air. Dozens of zipper elements are pushed out from the corner of William's eyes also known as zipper teeth. After thirty minutes, William's entire epidermis is peeled away and has been replaced with denim fabric. One hour after the transfiguration was complete, SCP-5907 self-extinguishes. End log. Cover story TT-31, Carbon Monoxide Leak, was enacted to explain the deaths of the Corbin family. All three corpses, as well as SCP-5907, were relocated to Site-51. All mentions of the corpse's mutation were removed from police records, and all emergency responders were amnesticized to remove memories of the incident. The investigation team attempted to locate the pawn shop described in the video, but public records indicate no such stores ever existed in the area. Incident Report On March 25, 2020 the three corpses were being moved from Biohazard Observation Chamber 3 to their permanent storage location in Safe Storage Locker 59. Upon being lifted, the corpses shed their outer layers, which formed a total of three denim jackets, six denim gloves, three pairs of denim pants, six denim socks, and three denim gimp masks. Aside from their creation, the clothing is not anomalous. Underneath the corpses' layers of clothing, were only skeletal remains and cotton stuffing. The Corbin family skeletons were incinerated, and the remaining clothing had been folded and stored within SCP-5907's containment locker. Level 3-4059 Classified Item number SCP-4059 Euclid Special Containment Procedures Provisional Site-144 has been constructed around SCP-4059-1 under the guise of a branch of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection NJDEP, Fish and Wildlife Office. Any civilians attempting to enter the vicinity of SCP-4059-1 are to be turned away due to the area being a protected habitat of a population of Crotalus horridus, timber rattlesnake. Presently, one instance of SCP-4059-2 is being held in a standard Type-C containment cell at Provisional Site-144. The instance is to be provided with fresh water from SCP-4059-1, replaced monthly, and is to be fed one live pig every three months. Should more instances of SCP-4059-2 be discovered, MTF Nu-5 Cabin Fever, is to be dispatched to contain the entity. Any person that has witnessed or has been attacked by an instance of SCP-4059-2 is to be administered Class A amnestics and released. SCP-4059-3 is to be stored in a safe deposit box at Provisional Site-144. Under no circumstances is Procedure 4059 Chemos to be performed. Description: SCP-4059 is the collective designation for a series of anomalies centered around the Pinelands National Reserve in New Jersey, USA. 
SCP-4059-1 is a 30-meter radius circular freshwater reservoir, located in the center of a 330-meter radius circular clearing, located west of the town of Leeds Point, New Jersey. Directly encircling the reservoir are six abandoned single-room cabins, estimated to have been built within the last 150 years. A mass grave was uncovered by Foundation archaeologists along the westernmost edge of the clearing. The gravesite was found to contain the assorted remains of an estimated 72 infants, many exhibiting severe physical deformities. The reservoir and its constituent structures are not anomalous, unless two compatible subjects attempt to perform Procedure 4059 Chemosh. SCP-4059-2 are bipedal hercine creatures that exhibit numerous deviations from non-anomalous goats. Notably, SCP-4059-2 entities are approximately 2 meters tall on average, with functional chiropteran wings protruding from the shoulder blades, anthropoid forelimbs terminating in hooked claws, prominent incisors, vestigial anthropomorphic mammary glands in the chest, and a thin, hairless forked tail. Like many species of non-anomalous goat, instances have a pair of large keratinous horns protruding from the top of their head and have a small bearded waddle dangling from the base of the chin. SCP-4059-2 are adept predators, stalking and incapacitating prey with a bite to the throat. Instances have been reported to be able to move at speeds upwards of 90 km per hour for brief periods of time in the pursuit of prey. SCP-4059-2 typically avoid human contact, but can become aggressive when trapped or provoked, and instances have been known to stalk and kill humans. At seemingly random intervals, SCP-4059-2 may return to SCP-4059-1 to drink. SCP-4059-3 is the personal journal of Japheth Bartosiewicz, a Polish immigrant. The journal includes details about the founding and daily life as a resident of SCP-4059-1, as well as instructions as to the proper execution of Procedure 4059 Chemosh. Using the detailed accounts found within SCP-4059-3, Procedure 4059 Chemosh has been developed. Procedure 4059 Chemosh takes place in three main stages between two members of opposite sexes. Hereafter, Subject A will denote the biologically male participant, and Subject B will denote the biologically female participant. Stage 1 Stage 1 must take place on the first night of the first full moon of the year and within the boundaries of SCP-4059-1. Subject A must gather 12 caps of any mushroom belonging to the Guinness Amanita death cap, and arrange them circularly equidistant around Subject B who is to be lying in a supine position. Subject A must connect adjacent caps in a circular fashion using blood of any animal belonging to the Guinness Capra domestic goat. Subject A must then use the blood to connect the caps in the form of a ritualistic seal that consists of four concentric, equilateral triangles that are offset from each other, with runes inscribed at the vertices of each triangle, as well as the center. The design of the runes can be found within SCP-4059-3 itself. Subject A must make an incision into each palm and across the upper chest of Subject B, and then do the same to himself. The subjects are to engage in sexual intercourse. If Stage 1 has been completed properly, Subject B will become pregnant regardless of biological fertility. Stage 2 Beginning immediately after Stage 1. Subject B must fast for the duration of each full moon under which they are pregnant, and may only eat during nighttime hours on such days. Defined as any time when the sun is at least 15 degrees below the horizon. Each nocturnal meal that Subject B has during the full moon is to be accompanied with a mix of the blood of an animal of the Guinness Capra and that of Subject A. Each meal is to be prefaced with a prayer. A list of acceptable prayers can be found within SCP-4059-3. If performed correctly, Subject B will be pregnant for exactly 265 days, 
will begin cervical dilation at exactly 1800 Eastern Time on day 264, and will give birth after exactly six hours of labor. It is to be noted that this will always result in birth during the full moon. Stage 3 When Subject B first goes into labor, Subject A must stand at the edge of the reservoir at the center of SCP-4059-1 and recite various prayers for three hours. During the childbirth process, Subject A will act as the midwife, aiding in the delivery of the child, hereafter referred to as Subject C. Upon delivery, Subject A is to cut the umbilical cord and douse Subject C with the blood. Subject B, aided by Subject A, must immediately carry Subject C to the reservoir at the center of SCP-4059-1 and drop them into the water. Subject C must be allowed to drown in the reservoir. The completion of this step marks the conclusion of Procedure 4059 Chemosh, and the corpse of Subject C will undergo a violent physical transformation into a fully grown instance of SCP-4059-2 upon death. Any attempts to prematurely remove Subject C from the body of water will result in the infant's eventual death by pulmonary edema, and failure to accurately carry out Procedure 4059 chemos in any way will result in the severe disfigurement and eventual death of Subject C shortly after birth. Addendum 4059-2 Abridged entries found within SCP-4059-3 Translated from Polish April 12, 1894 Perhaps the elders were right. Perhaps we should not have rejected the old ways and spat in the face of tradition. The gods must be laughing at us. Laughing at me. How foolish was I to sacrifice the purity of my sacred blood for love? How foolish were my friends to do the same? One cannot laugh in the face of tradition, in the face of the blessing bestowed upon our people by the Prophet Ion himself and not expect retribution, and yet we have regardless. This cursed land is not one of prosperity, as we have been led to believe. The soil is next to useless. Nothing will grow in the harsh clay of the forest, nor in the dry sand of the beaches. All we can do to survive is hunt, fish, and trade with a nearby town for sustenance. This hardship, I fear, is our curse. Despite our transgressions, I believe such a debt can be paid, and being forsaken by those we love and cast out to this land, perhaps we can atone for our sins and begin anew by claiming this territory for the old blood. Even with impurity, it may please the Boltus to begin anew, to root our ancient seeds here such that we may flourish. Also referred to as Archons among Sarkites, in Sarkite mythology, the Archons are six beings that act as primordial embodiments of chaos. Each Archon is believed to have challenged Ion, with Ion's victory over these trials granting him transcendent powers. November 30, 1894 We have been trying for nearly a year now, but none of us have managed to conceive. I fear that our attempts to bring forth children of impure blood have insulted the desired one, a retribution for our impurity. I have brought attention to this plight four days ago and asked by Ken to ponder the situation. Today, I was asked if I remember the tales of the Holy Flesh Weavers. The way that the elders talked about them, their ability to bend muscle and bone to their every whim through skilled lahook attack, gave us an idea. Translation from Old Adatite Fleshcraft My companions seem to think that we can use those sacred rites to lift our curse and purify our lineage with sculpted progeny. Perhaps they are correct. We will have to discuss the matter further, and consult what few texts we took with us when we were forced into exile. January 11, 1895 It is done. Last night was the full moon, the first opportunity to test the blood promise. Each of us spent the night cleaning our wounds, questioning if this was worth it. It makes me wonder. Should we even bother attempting to resurrect that which is dead? We have disappointed our families and spat on the graves of our ancestors with our betrayal of the blood. Would it not be considered hubris to assume that these sins can be forgiven? What right do we have as pariahs 
to assume the mantle of an emergent dynasty? Regardless, we shall find out soon if the gods see fit to bless us with children. February 26, 1895 It seems our prayers have been answered, and we may offer our heritage to the gods. Despite a plague of barren wombs, all the women in our coven have swelled with life after the first implementation of the rites. There are powerful forces at work, and they offer us the chance to carry forth the legacy of our ancestors for years to come. October 3, 1895 The women have borne their children, and it has become clear that there is much work to do. The young ones were not powerful sorcerers of Lahukatat as was expected, but instead were broken and twisted husks. They died before taking a single breath, and so we have been left with nothing. Yet still, for the sake of fulfilling our promise to the gods, we must persist. We must amend the spells until we bear great and terrible children that may ascend to honor their ancestors as Holy Karsis. Transcription Note The next twelve years of entries detail proposed changes to Procedure 4059 Chemosh, as well as brief descriptions of the results of the new procedures, leading to the thirteenth and final iteration of the procedure. Dr. Levy October 9, 1908 the devourer must relish this day. When we were first blessed with children, I had foolishly thought that exile was a sufficient atonement for our sins, and now we have paid dearly for my presumption. The sacrament was successful, and it was our reckoning. How quickly our joy morphed into horror as the children emerged from the water as beasts who did not recognize their own kin. Their bodies stretched and twisted as they grew unnatural features. Wings tore open the skin of their backs, and horns pierced their foreheads. Their faces stretched into goats, and their nails curved into deadly talons. Each one let out a horrific shriek as they stretched out for the first time. Then they saw us standing there, frozen in shock and fear. The beasts slaughtered their own mothers with ravenous fury, and likewise turned on their fathers. And so I ran like a coward. I ran from my home, from my wife and from my monstrous child. I ran from the sounds of tearing flesh and screaming demons. Transcription Note This is the last entry in SCP-4059-3. Foundation investigators have found records of a Jafet Martosowitz that had lived in the town of Leeds Point in the years following those depicted in SCP-4059-3. It has been hypothesized that Mr. Martosowitz integrated himself into the Leeds Point community and lived there for the remainder of his life. Dr. Levy